and welcome back as we continue our study through Philippians. We had a break for a couple weeks there, um, but we're going to get right back on track where we left off, and tonight we'll be in chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Now, since we had that break, I'm going to take a second to just kind of recap everything that's led us up to this point briefly uh, before we dig in to read our passage. Um, And because of that, and because of the amount uh, that we have to work through tonight, um, between going through 12 through 18 altogether, um, I I broke it down, and instead of how I would typically do it, Clause by clause is how I prefer to do a study like this. Um, Going more verse by verse on your handout, that's how it's laid out. Um, But kind of a last-minute decision um, was to really break it down into going over verse 12 first, then verse 13, and then kind of summarizing 12 and 13 together, and then going into verses 14 through 16 together, and then hitting verses 17 and 18 together at the end. So on your handout, it's still going to be verse by verse, but um, just so you know, there was a last-minute change that I had made with the format and how I'm going to work through this. Um, So that's the reason uh, for for any difference that you see in how I'm moving through it and how it is outlined on your paper there. Um, So previously, as as we began in Philippians, we saw this flow of thought from Paul as he's talking to the church at Philippi. And and he starts off with this, expressing his great joy. And we see this prayer of thanksgiving and this prayer for the Philippians uh, that, that that he writes out in this epistle as part of his introductory content. And in that, he expresses his great joy and a very specific prayer for them and how they would live their lives and how they would stand fast as one unified body together. If you remember, that's kind of the big so what of this epistle of living as a unified body under the headship of Christ and how to live a Christian life up against a non-Christian world, kind of the big so what of the letter. Um, The other things that we see in there as far as joy and unity and a lot of different things that many people have pulled out from the letters, what they see as the main points, are really the underlying themes that kind of support Paul's main point of the headship of Christ and his work in unifying his people together as one body. And so we see all the rest of that as like an outpouring of that work of Christ in his people. And then he gets into really explaining how they should be living their lives. If, if, if Christ is really who he says he is, and Christ has really done the work in them that, that Scripture says that Christ has done, then this should also be true, and he's speaking about the believers themselves and, and what their lives should look like individually and as a body striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. And then he gets into giving his own example. We see his example played out with his current experience as he's in prison. We see him give the example of Christ and and Christ's example of humility there, which is really what I consider to be the main point of the entire letter. That's that's really Paul's gospel presentation in, in this epistle. And in each one of his letters, he'll do this in different ways. And when he talks about Christ and, and how Christ came and how Christ did his work, that using that as an example for the people at Philippi, that, that is the gospel presentation right there from Paul. And it's, and it's really the centerpiece of what he is getting at here, and that if this is true, so let this be true of you. And he says to follow that example, and, and, and in all of this, he talks about their humility. Well, in our passage tonight, we're going to see this connection between that and doing everything without grumbling and complaining, because all that does is so tension and, and, and it's no humility in any of that. And we see a connection with all of this to Israel, as well as directly with Christ and his work. It's a contrast there that he makes. Um, and there's not a lot of allusions or citations in Philippians to the Old Testament. Tonight, we're going to see one of them. There's really only two left that we're going to come across. There's one that we're going to see tonight and one later on in chapter 4. 
And so that's, that's where we're at tonight, getting really into the so what, having just seen Christ's example, the gospel message, and Christ's obedience and his humility, and now we see what Paul is really getting at towards the outpouring of this in the, the lives of the believers. So I'll pray, and then we'll dig into our passage and begin our study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night that you've given us and drawing us together. As always, Lord, I don't ever want to take this for granted, your work drawing us together. Your people, they might come together and praise you. We might collectively together learn and grow by your spirit according to your word in ways that glorify you and build one another up. And I pray that Your word here tonight, spoken, would do just that, that you would be glorified in it. Send your spirit to be with us tonight. Teach us and continue to do the work that you began. In your son's name we pray, amen. All right, so verse 12 through 18. Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world." holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, I mentioned that there's going to be a bit of a difference in how it's outlined on your handout tonight, which is verse by verse, and how I'm going to be flowing through this. Um, and I, the reason is because there's, there's really three parts to our passage tonight. Verse 12, we see the believer's part, right? So some people call it the believer's response or the believer's action in this. The second In verse 13, we see God's part in all of this being spelled out. Now, verses 12 and 13 are really intertwined. And so at the end of verses 12 and 13, I'll I'll kind of give a bit of a summary and, and talk about three different trajectories that we see coming from this, depending on how people interpret this passage and the the extremes that we have a tendency to go to, really. And then we get into the outcome in verses 14 through 18. And so there's really those three different parts right there. Verses 14 and 18 all break down into two really separate sections, but it's really the outcome of this work that is being done in God's people. And so we'll go back to verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So here we have a reference to Israel in the wilderness. Now, what do we see taking place? Well, we see Moses going up on the mountain to receive the commandments from God. Now, when this happens, God's presence descends upon the mountain. We see this cloud. We get this image, thunder and lightning shaking this mountain. The people bear witness to this. All of Israel sees this, and, and they are struck with fear. They... They know this is God descending upon this mountain, and they're, they're in fear. And this is kind of important to understand, because in Deuteronomy 9, we see that Moses was up there for 40 days and 40 nights. So he was up there for, for quite a bit of time. It wasn't a quick trip. But at any rate, the people grew impatient. And in their impatience, they end up disobeying God. They end up rebelling against him. And in Deuteronomy 9 and Exodus 30, or these these are parallel accounts, we see the golden calf, which takes place right after this. And so this people who 
have been rescued by God out of their bondage in Egypt, have borne witness to his incredible power in saving them, have seen him do incredible things in a very short amount of time, right? So this is still very early on, immediately after the Exodus actually takes place. We're not at the point where they have been condemned to wander in the wilderness for 40 years yet. We're not even there yet. And so the, these people immediately begin to disobey God. And Paul's contrasting, making a contrast here between disobedient, unfaithful Israel in, the, in those times, having actually borne witness to God and his power and what he expects what he sees with the church at Philippi. And that's also important because the church at Philippi was also contending with Jews where they were at, who Paul considers to be unfaithful. They're, in fact, the ones who threw him in prison when he was at Philippi. And so they're contending with this, and there, but there's also a contrast between them now and ancient Israel and how they were in the past. They turned and rebelled against God. Now what is really interesting, going back to Israel, is that Moses, fast forward to right before they enter into the promised land, Moses is giving final instructions to the people. And in Deuteronomy 31, verses 26 through 27, knowing that his time is drawing to an end, as he gives these instructions, says, Take this book of the law and put it by the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. Behold, even today, while I am yet alive and with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? So he's speaking about the, the entire time while I am alive and with you, the entire time that they have been in the wilderness. That's what he's talking about. He says, how much more after my death? That's not a question. That's actually a statement that, that he's making there. He's not asking them how much more will they rebel. He's stating it. He knows what's going to happen with this people. Yet, God is faithful. And in all of this, just as he promised, he continued to bring about his plans and salvation through this same stubborn people. And we fast forward, and we know the end result of that as we see God brings about his plans, and we see the Messiah, just as promised, who comes and delivers his people. Now, whether Paul is intentionally making uh, an allusion here to Israel as the backdrop of what he's saying or not is kind of irrelevant. Personally, I think that he is, but that's really ir irrelevant. We can clearly see a contrast between these two people here, between this disobedience and the obedience. We just talked about Christ's obedience in our previous passage, even obedience to the death on a cross. And so that's an example that these people are expected to follow. Not that Paul is trying to tell them to pursue getting hung up on a cross, but that their life would be just as faithful, just as obedient in, in following Christ's example. So it doesn't matter if that's the backdrop or not. Now we go back to chapter 1, verse 20, and we're speaking of how they have always Paul says, as you have always obeyed, so now. But Paul also gives this example in his own life. Chapter 1, verse 20, he speaks the same thing. Now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Just before that, he says of the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So he's speaking of from the very first moment when he entered into Philippi. He arrives there and begins to proclaim the gospel. There's this response from everybody there that he, that he preaches the gospel to. Lydia, the Philippian jailer, his family, everybody there. And he's saying that from that moment on, you have been faithful. And we've seen him talk about this previously in expressing his great joy for these people and the fact that they have been faithful partners. I mean, these people have sought out ways to participate in the gospel. They have, 
willingly sacrificed multiple times, not just with Epaphroditus bringing Paul this, this gift while he's currently in prison, but previously sacrificing to help the body, not just at Philippi, but collectively everywhere, that they've sought this out, a faithful community of believers. And he's saying, now, as always, you have obeyed, continue in this. And so it's really interesting. We can see this comparison here between the, the new covenant believers joined together by Christ and his work on the cross and the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit versus Israel in the Old Testament who were in the presence of God by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night, the same resting over the temple, watching him do incredible things firsthand and still rebelling. Yet by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Paul is demonstrating that this people has the power within them to continue to obey and be faithful just as Christ did, to follow in his example. Now Paul is well aware of what the Philippians are up against. And we've talked about this before, about how he knows what they are currently facing and what they're going to be facing. He's well aware of this. He's lived it out in his own life, and he knows what's up ahead for them, as well as churches everywhere that he has been to. And he knows that it's not going to be easy. And that's why we see preceding this Christ's example as he lays it out for them, basically telling them this is the only way. That if you are to remain strong, if you are to stand firm, that it cannot be by your own power, by your own strength, by your own wisdom, that it must be in Christ. It must be through his power. Christ living in you is what we're about to be getting into here with verse 13. By that example alone that Christ lived and died on that cross. And in following that example, he says, to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. So I'll start off with fear and trembling. Fear, phobos, it, it communicates two senses to us. It's used in both ways. Fear as in terror and fear as in awe, reverence. It's used both ways. Now for those who are hostile to God, it's only ever used as terror. It's not used as an awe and reverence. They don't revere God in any way those who are hostile to him. So it will only ever be terror. But for the children of God, it's really both. We think about it. There is an aspect of like a child who knows that if they disobey their parents, there will be consequences. A child knows this. They come to learn this over time. They'll struggle against it. They'll fight against it. But in the end, the parent will continue to teach and work with their children, and over time, the child learns this, that there are consequences for disobedience. And so it is the same thing with children of God. We understand this, that there are still consequences for disobedience. But we also know that in all of that, there is also grace, and there is love, and a parent also shows this to a child. And it's patience, it's love, it's kindness, it's the fruit of the Spirit, and it makes perfect sense if we think about, well, whose Spirit? Well, it's God's Spirit, and that's where it comes from. So it's really the fruit of the Spirit there, and that's what builds in us this sense of awe, this reverence for God, knowing who He is, the power that He has, the knowledge, the wisdom. He's infinite. And we think about all of these things and then how he comes down to us and he cares for us. Can you think of any better response than to stand there in fear? Both trembling, terror, and reverence, awe, and wonder at this incredible God 
who would do such a thing. It speaks really of all of his character, his nature, all at once. When Paul talks about this, this fear and trembling, it's not just standing there in terror, but in awe and reverence, out of love and out of respect. Christ says this elsewhere, that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's kind of the same thing. Well, why? Why keep his commandments? Is it just because he said so? No, it's because of who he is. And because we stand in awe of him. Because he loves us, and he drew us, and he saved us. And so we follow him for nothing more than that. Than he is who he is. We talked about this this past Sunday, actually. Now, work out. It should be translated as you work out. And it's plural. So he's... He's speaking not just to an individual believer, and I've kind of talked about how Paul does this previously. So he's not just speaking to an individual believer. He's speaking to collectively as a body, as well as the individual believers within that body. And what he says here, you work out, it has a continuous aspect to it. It doesn't end. It's not, well, do this and you'll be all right, and nothing else has to happen here. Nor is he speaking of, them actually saving themselves. The believer actually saves themselves. The context that we're going to get to with verse 13 doesn't support such a view in any way. The believer doesn't save themselves. They don't accomplish this in any way, but it demonstrates what all of Scripture teaches, that there is a dual aspect here. Yes, it is God who saves us, and it is God's Spirit indwelling in us, but there is still a part that we have in this in responding. Now, that doesn't go so far as what some people would try to argue that, well, you're just saved by your faith and then nothing. Or they'll say, well, you choose to be saved and then you get to live how you want. That's, that's not at all what any of that means. There, there is a part that we play here. Unfortunately, in our effort to try to rationalize both sides of this, we end up going down one extreme or another. And I'll talk about that, these three different trajectories when I summarize 12 and 13. But work out isn't talking about them actually accomplishing their salvation. It's, it's the daily life that they are called to. The work that God has created for them, has called them to, and is empowering them to do. For them to walk in this daily. To flee from sin. To pursue righteousness to do the work that you are called to, to be the partners that Paul speaks of of the Philippians, that they are participants in the gospel, striving side by side. Like I've I've used the, the Roman legion as an example before and how they operate together, right, under the headship of their commander, following his commands, doing what he says needs to be done, and they follow that, and they're working within that, okay, is kind of what he's getting at here. And the continuous aspect of that is, we will see this here in a moment, in the day of Christ, as I've mentioned before, that's a reference to the end of times, the end of the age, when Christ returns again. And so this continuous aspect, it's the entire life of the believer. So we see justification, sanctification, which is what we're talking about now, and glorification in Christ's return. Okay? So he's talking about this entire life, this sanctification, that takes place, to continue to walk in this, in what Christ is calling you to do and to be, how you are to live. We go back to the examples that Paul has given us previously and how he's told them they should be living if all of this is true, to continue to do this, to be obedient in this. He says it elsewhere like this in Galatians, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. That's in Galatians 5.25. And this means that the idea that we have no part after salvation, that's ludicrous. We do have a part. It's obedience. Follow him. That's active. It's not passive. We don't save ourselves and then do nothing. God saves and we respond because he gives us the desire and the ability, which is what we get into with verse 13 in this daily life that we live, 
So for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now this verse presents God's part in all of this, which really is at, at play in all of it. It's, it's not just like there's two sides here that exist apart from one another, and that's why people tend to go down one extreme or another, because it's hard to rationalize. Well, at what part do I begin the work and God no longer does? And that's not the point. It's always God. God is always at the center of all of it, consistently. He's always there. He doesn't, as some people try to explain, create, sets up the dominoes, right, and then hits the first domino and steps back and watches it. That's not how this works. The dominoes are continuing to fall, but he's still active in all of it, engaged in all of it. And we see his attributes at work here, his nature, namely his personal, affectionate, and caring nature being depicted here. It is God who works in you. That's a a personal statement. That's not a God who's far off, distant, separated. We contrast this with the pagan gods. We can look at the gods of all kinds of other religions. We can look at how people worship different animals for whatever reason, or they create some kind of God. And in pretty much every case, what's interesting is that these pagan gods that they worship are often distanced, they're uncaring, they're uninvolved, and most of the time they spend their, their days mocking those who worship them. That's how they're depicted. What's interesting about that is those are all human characteristics. And that makes sense when we consider that they're created by humans. But the one true God of the Bible was not created by man. And so he does not have the human characteristics His are divine. They're contrasted here. And we see a very personal, loving, and caring God being depicted in this verse here who is continuously at work in his people. And remember before in Philippians, Paul says that God will be faithful to continue the work that he started in you, to complete this work. And here's the work that he's talking about. Energeo, to work. It's active. This is an active word, not not something that's passive. It's very active, to be in action, to be at work, engaged in you. It's not dominoes set up and then stepping away, watching it all unfold. He's actively at work. We also say it like this, the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. That's what this is a reference to. God's Spirit at work in you actively, continuously, particularly in his people, as Paul says, in you, speaking directly to the church at Philippi. And then he goes on to say, to will and to work. So this first word, thelo, will, it means will, speaks to a matter of desire, right? And so this isn't an emotional word. It doesn't communicate an emotional sense in in any way. It's purposeful, intentional. It's something that resonates deeply within the person. It's the spirit indwelling. And And it's deep inside. It's like a fire that begins to kind of burn. So I'll explain it a little bit with my own personal story here, that in 2015, uh, I kind of had this this weight. I, I really can't explain it in any other way than that, that all of my experiences, all of my mistakes, all the lessons that I've learned, all the things that I've done, successes, failures, whatever it may be, that it's all going to be used for something. But I didn't understand what that was. But at the time, I just thought, well, to teach young men how to not make the mistakes that I made. And that's kind of where I sat for a good long while. And I didn't really understand what it was that I was feeling, this desire that was building in me. And so I didn't really talk about it a whole lot because I didn't understand it. And then we get to my retirement, and that's when everything starts to change for me. And I've talked about that a little bit, but as I progressed in that walk, that's when I began to have 
other men speak into my life, uh, at, whether at school or um, friends uh, of our family, and even here, Thomas Yarrington, the times that I've spent uh, meeting with him, and all of this starting to become more clear that, no, you're not just going to teach young men how to not make the mistakes that you made in life, that you're going to be working to help teach God's people in general and let the Bible do the rest. You don't need to teach them how to not live the life you lived. Help them see Christ and let God's Spirit do the rest. And that's kind of where I've come to, but it all started because a desire was placed there. I know I didn't understand it at first. It began to grow, and the body collectively helped that, helped me kind of grow in that understanding and develop the picture of what that looks like. That doesn't mean that, oh, once you finally get some clarity about what you're going to be doing within the body for God and the work that he's calling you to, that you're somehow going to be perfect in it. That's not what that means. We are all collectively continuing to learn and grow, and we do this together. But each one of us has a part. Each one of us should have a desire that is growing within us, that, that God is doing a work in us. He gives that desire to obey and to work, as he says in here, to will and to work. So he places the desire there, and then he equips you to do it. Psalm 119, verse 36 says, Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Now this is kind of connected a little bit to where we previously spoke about Ephesians chapter 2. And it's both God's grace and our faith that are gifts from God. And if you remember the email I had sent out that kind of breaks down the grammar and how we come to an understanding that Paul, when, when, when he when he says this to the church at Ephesus, the, the language he used, the way he speaks, indicates that it's both God's grace and even our faith being a gift from God. Remember, it's God who removed the scales off of Paul's eyes, not Paul. So it is God's Spirit that does that within us and builds that and draws us. No one comes to the Son unless they are drawn by the Father it is him who builds that and calls his people. My sheep hear my voice. They know me. They come to me. They listen. They respond, right? He's the shepherd. So that's God at work in his people, continuously drawing them and equipping them. So when he says, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, that is, is really where it's all focused at. The Holy Spirit indwelling in God's people, lighting that fire, so to speak, drawing them, giving them the desire to serve, to love, to be with, to follow, and equips them to do what he is calling them to do. Just as Paul speaks of himself as God's chosen instrument, and that's exactly what Christ calls him in Acts. He will be a chosen instrument of mine. And Paul looks at the Philippians in the same way, that they are called to something and that God is equipping them for it and they are now to be obedient in this and follow him. Now I said I would wrap up verses 12 and 13 and I would talk briefly about three different trajectories that we see coming from this passage. First, there is the passive. And these are the people who say there is nothing you do regarding salvation. And they are right in that. And each of these different trajectories all agree on that point. There's nothing we do in saving ourselves. We don't, we don't grab onto some life preserver. No, God saves you, period. It's his work. Because if you grab on and make the choice, well, I chose him, that's a work. And if God looked out into the future and said, well, because you're going to choose me, I will choose you, that's based on merit. The Bible's clear. It's not based on works and it's not based on merit. God saves his people. End of story. All three trajectories agree on this, on that one singular point. But this one goes deeper with the passive. It's really an antinomian philosophy, anti-against nomos law, against the law, antinomian. And what they're saying basically is that you're saved by faith and then nothing else really matters after that. 
you don't have to continue to pursue righteousness. You don't have to continue to live a life of repentance. The Bible says flee from sin, but what it's really saying is that, well, it's not something you have to be concerned with because of your faith. And for somebody who struggles with discernment, that can rapidly and has rapidly led to an antinomian lifestyle, also an abuse of Christian liberties, where something may not necessarily be a sin for someone, but you might take it to a point of idolatry because of this freedom that you have, or you may cause somebody else to stumble in this. So it's a very dangerous place to stand, this passive position. But on the opposite side of that spectrum, we see the pious, the person who has an extreme standard of conduct, that you have to do certain things, strict strict discipline in reading scripture, in prayer, and in doing works, well, it's legalism, plain and simple. That's what it leads to, being on that other extreme side. Now, as far apart as these two trajectories are, they're actually the same sin. It's been described, antinomianism and legalism, as two sides of the same coin. And it's really selfishness. It's, it's not a single bit of it is really informed by the word of God, but it's informed by a desire to rationalize it for ourselves because we can't always rationalize things in Scripture. And because of that, we have a tendency to go to one extreme or another. But there's another trajectory here. And this takes us to really this, this kind of middle ground right here in the center where we have to be comfortable with a little bit of mystery. I asked the question... Where does God doing this work and me having a response and doing some work, where does that all end and begin? There's some mystery in that. And because we have a problem being comfortable with a certain amount of mystery and not being able to rationalize things to the nth degree and fully explain it as like I can explain how paper is made, we tend to try to go down certain roads, and we don't want to just stay comfortable with something. God is at work in his people, and there is a response from his people in that. We don't have to be able to explain, and at no point does Paul make any attempt to explain that. He simply just says it. God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And if we look at that doctrine systematically, What he's getting at, God saves, it's his work alone. But there is also work for you to do. You are being called purposefully for a reason. And that reason is to glorify God. What that looks like for each one of you individually within the body is going to be a little bit different according to how the Spirit is equipping you, each one uniquely. And that's what he's telling them here. And so... What does this look like moving forward for the Philippians? Well, we get into the next three verses, 14 through 16. This is the output that we're getting into of this work that God is doing in them and their obedience. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And here's where we we continue this comparison with Israel in the wilderness. In Exodus 17, we see the people quarreling. They're quarreling with Moses over water. And the reality is that they weren't just being quarrelsome with Moses. They were complaining about God even bringing them into the wilderness, grumbling, complaining the entire time. They even started to complain about the food that was being provided to them by God. Started talking about uh, to be back in Egypt and have all of these different foods again. They were complaining about God. And in Exodus 17, 7, we see that they're testing God. As it says, they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? So they're questioning him. They're being quarrelsome, not just with Moses but with God. And that's really what we come down to when within the body 
we are like this with each other. Grumbling, disputing, being quarrelsome with each other. We're really doing this against God. Because if we are one body united under the headship of Christ, then who are we quarreling against? So this grumbling and disputing, along with the mention of Yodia and Sintike in chapter 4, these two women who Paul exhorts to agree in the Lord, have led many to believe that this is the main point of Paul's letter. It's, it's really not. It's just it's an underlying theme of it. But it does speak to the unity But Paul had just commanded the Philippians to be in full accord and of one mind, not selfish, to count others as more significant than themselves. At no point can someone accomplish any of that if they are busy grumbling and disputing like Israel in the wilderness. You can't live both of those lives at one time here. It just doesn't work. You can't accomplish any of that. What this typically leads to Arrogance and disunity. And we see people do this all the time within the body, grumbling, disputing. I've had people walk up to me and just point blank ask me, what's your theological background? That seems like an innocent question, but that comes from an agenda, typically. And any time that's been asked of me, I have always proceeded with great caution. Because if we are both in Christ... What does my background really have to do with anything if we're both in Christ? If we agree on the things that are essential, what about grace and the things that aren't essential? In the points where it, there's room for us to, to disagree, I've brought up eschatology several points. We can disagree on stuff like that. What about the things that matter? We're supposed to be united in these things, not being divided and disputing and arguing and grumbling over things that really don't matter. And so my theological background shouldn't be the question. It should be, how can we serve our Lord? How can we follow him together? Can we talk about the things that we have disagreements on? Yes, absolutely, and we should. But we shouldn't grumble and we shouldn't dispute. We shouldn't be quarrelsome. We should be working to lift one another up. We should be working together, side by side, for the faith of the gospel. Paul is pushing them in that direction. You see other churches at this time. Corinth is a perfect example. And all the problems that existed there. And all of it comes from departing from precisely what Paul is talking about here. They had departed from all of this completely. Paul spends those two letters, 1 and 2 Corinthians, trying to get them back to where they're supposed to be. The church at Philippi has not departed from that. Paul is exhorting them to continue in this. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. That includes everything that God has given them to work in. The desire that he's built in them to will and to work. Do all of that without grumbling or disputing. Don't be divided be one body under the headship of Christ, so that you may be blameless and innocent, building in this outcome, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. And here is where we really get into the the hard, the, the, the direct allusion back to Deuteronomy in 32.5. And we also have a reference here to, to Matthew chapter 5, the salt and light, shining as lights. And Matt, or Jesus says this in Matthew in chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, the salt and the light. But that is who you are. This is what you do. You are my people. You will shine. And so shining as a light in the world does set you apart in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Are we any different today? If we look around us, are we not different than what the world around us says people should be and we should believe? There is a huge difference there. So if you follow Christ, you are going to be different. You are going to look different. Thomas likes to quote Paul Washer all all the time and say that if you get hit by a Mack truck, you're going to look different. And, And that's very true. 
If you follow Christ, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb at times. But this allusion to Deuteronomy 32.5, they have dealt corruptly with him. They are no longer his children because they are blemished. They are a crooked and twisted generation. Paul's usage here is almost a complete citation from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, but with a twist. He takes it and spins it a little bit so that he can contrast the Gentile believers at Philippi who are faithful and the unbelieving Jews who they are contending with. And remember, like I said, it's the Jews who, throw, who threw Paul in prison when he was at Philippi. They're contending with them right now at this time that he writes this letter. He knows that they're up against this. I mentioned, again, there's a lot of citations. This is really the second to last one, but it's almost... It's almost a complete quote that he, that he spins on this to do a contrast. And he's contrasting these two different people, Israel and the church today, the new covenant believers, the body of Christ. And what this demonstrates to us is that all of the promises that we see in the Old Testament, everything that we see contained there, it was never about a nation wasn't about a nation. Paul's very clear on this in Galatians and in Romans that it was never about a nation of people. It was always about God's people. What is the church? What has Paul been, who's he been writing these letters to? The church. What is the church? Is it a building? That's the same thing as saying that Israel is just a nation. It's not. The church is the people of God. It's God's people joined together, collectively, united, under the headship of Christ. And that all of his promises, not just a bunch of laws, all point to something. They're all being fulfilled in one man, in Christ. And they will continue to be fulfilled in that as God continues to be faithful in completing his promises to complete the work that he began, that he will do in the day of Christ which is the return of Christ. And he does so despite the rebellion, despite people being disobedient, supposedly God's people, like children, stumbling, tripping over ourselves, and that he is continually faithful in all of this, and that he will fulfill his promises. And again, he knows what the Philippians are facing, and he desires for them to hold fast, as he says in verse 16, hold fast to the word of life, He knows what they're up against. So how do you live a Christian life up against a non-Christian world? It's all all here. Hold fast to the word of life. What is it that Christ has instructed? What is it that he has taught us, both in word and in his example and how he lived? What is it that all of Scripture points us to? Not just following a, a set of laws legalistically, but understanding what they are there for and what they direct us to. How they reveal to us our need for him and point us to him. So how do we hold fast to the word of life? By following the example that Christ gave, that Paul had just explained. And in that, he says, so that in the day of Christ, that's a reference to Christ's second coming. We've seen this before. The day of Christ is consistently used eschatologically, last things, end of times. So when Christ returns for his bride, that I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So Paul uses this word, kakema, and it can be used as sinful boasting, and it is used that way in James chapter 4, verse 16. It can also be used, the same word, as honor, exulting, or rejoicing. And it's used that way in Romans chapter 5, verse 11. So it can be used both ways. So how is Paul using it here? How does Paul use this to describe believers and how they should be living? Well, he consistently discusses boasting and is emphatic that boasting is sin. Boasting in self has no place in the believer's life. Paul even talks about how he has more reason to boast in the flesh than anybody else, but he counts it all as loss for the sake of knowing Christ. 
Only boasting in Christ is what Paul does. He doesn't boast in himself. He cannot boast in himself here. It's not what he's doing. He's speaking of rejoicing. If at Christ's return, the Philippians are presented blameless and without blemish, without fault, Paul will rejoice. He won't brag about his own accomplishments, but he will rejoice. The work that he called to, he was called to, was not in vain. The work that he was in, the work that he will eventually die for, that Christ called him to, is not in vain. These people are in Christ, and they are there with him to worship eternally at the foot of Christ's throne and be with him forever. He will rejoice in this. Paul is stating a desire that is within all who labor in the text. I share this desire with Paul. The rest of the elders here share this desire as well. To be used in a way that God's people glorify him is a blessing. Each one of us is called in this, in a way, in our own ways, individually, how we're being equipped. You all have a part in this. In, in being used in a way that God's people glorify him. Paul is expressing his desire to see this happen and to see God's people grow and to see God glorified and to see this play out and to see those people at the end. What greater thing could there possibly be than to be standing there side by side, each one of us looking at each other as we worship our King forever together? That's a blessing. That's something to rejoice in. That's Paul's great hope here. These people will not depart from this. That the work of the Holy Spirit in them will continue to grow them and propel them towards that end. That day of glorification when Christ returns. Without blemish. Without fault. That's what we should all be desiring to see with each other. As we work to build one another up. To grow the body and to glorify God. How incredible would that be? And finally, in verse 17 and 18, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you should be glad and rejoice with me. So Paul's rejoicing in this goes beyond this life, as we see quite clearly here. Pour out as a drink offering comes from one word in the Greek. So we see this really this basically a sentence that comes from one word, spendo, this short little word. And it's only used in this form twice, here and in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, where he says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Now, we've talked before how there's plenty of evidence that Paul was released from prison after this time where he's writing the letter, then when we see later when he's writing what's known as the prison epistles, we see 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, that at the end of that is when he's executed. And the way that he speaks in there, like he does in 2 Timothy 4, 6, and the time of my departure has come, he knows that the, that the end is near for him. Now, the drink offering itself is a reference to the offerings in the Old Testament. And we see one example of this in Numbers chapter 15, verse 5. And these drink offerings often accompanied sacrifices of different types. They were typically involved in some way. This is usually described as like a hint of wine. It was just a small amount of wine. So this drink offering, he says he's being poured out. And there's two senses communicated here. Commentators like to divide over this. I don't think there's any reason to divide. I see both senses clearly communicated in this one. That Paul knows that his days are numbered. He makes that clear earlier in this letter, and he makes that clear in his use of the same word in 2 Timothy, that his days are numbered and that he will eventually depart and be absent from these people. Remember, he says, whether I'm with you or I'm absent. So he knows that this is an inevitable outcome, that eventually he will depart. But there's also the other sense that he, he talks about our lives being a living sacrifice like he does in Romans. And that's the other sense that's communicated here, that his entire life and all of the work that he's been called to and that he's been doing is being lived out in worship of God as a living sacrifice. So there's both senses being communicated here. I think they both 
fit quite nicely with the context. And there's no need to divide and go, well, it's only this or it's only this. Well, we, can, we can see both of these here. As he lives all of this, does all of this to God's glory and worship of him as a living sacrifice. And so he knows that his imprisonment can lead to his death. He knows that he's there because of Christ. We've talked about that previously as well. And we know that all of this is done to God's glory and how he does his work. And he says, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. Now, as I said, a drink offering often accompanied a sacrifice of some type. He's equating the faith of the Philippians who have already sacrificed much and will continue to sacrifice much in the future. That's what he's equating it with the sacrifice that this drink offering typically accompanies, that they are also sacrificing here in the midst of all of this, and he himself is being poured out. And the end result is the great joy that Paul's already expressed in all of this because of that, because of their sacrifice and how they have continuously lived their life and that they should continue to live in this manner. And in this, he finds great joy, much of it, as he lifts up the Philippians' faith in these final verses. So we talk about this example that has been set for the Philippians and how Paul expects them to live their lives. Next, we're going to talk about Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, Epaphroditus is the one who carried this financial gift from Philippi to Paul while he's in prison in Rome. And it nearly cost him his life in doing so. And Epaphroditus also brought him news of what's taking place at Philippi, which is how we know these two women who there's tension between them. And he also is going to be speaking about Timothy. And we're going to see this lived out in the lives of these two faithful men as he talks about what they do and what they're going to do. And in this, we're also going to see Paul's expectation that Timothy is Paul's successor. This is where we get into him naming him as the one who is going to succeed him in the work that Paul has been doing. As Timothy, we've already discussed, is basically Paul's pupil. And he has been training him since, since he picked him up on his journeys in Lystra. And so we will continue in this example and how they should be living their life in the example of these two faithful brothers in the in next week study. So I will pray, and then if we have any questions, I will take them at that time. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this night. Father, thank you for your word. The ways that you've revealed yourself in it is incredible. To think about the work that you do in us, in all of your people and what that means for us and our part in this in simply just following you and obeying you, keeping your commandments, doing the work that you've called us to, that you are equipping each one of us to. Lord, help us, each one of us, to see what that looks like in our lives. Help each one of us walk with one another, to grow one another and lift one another up in those ways that you may be glorified and more people may come to know you and that the body may continue to grow in love and wisdom to be the people that you have called us to be without grumbling, without disputing, without, without divisiveness over things that don't matter, but being united in what matters most. And that's Christ. May your spirit continue to do this work in your people and continue to grow them in this. Be with each one here as we depart and go our ways tonight. And bring us back together, united as one. And may we continue to glorify you in all that we say and do as we leave this place tonight. In your son's name we pray, amen.